to say how thrilled we are at the enormous success of the Walkley Media Talks in here in Brisbane, which has surpassed our wildest expectations. It's a great credit to the quality of Queensland journalists we have as panellists and to the Brisbane community who have shown such interest and engagement with journalism. I'd like to thank those involved in the Citizen J program, the EDGE and the State Library of Queensland, for maintaining the high standards that Australians expect of the Walkley Foundation. As you may have heard that the 2012 Walkley presentation will be held at Parliament House in Canberra this year um, to help celebrate the centenary of Canberra in 2012, sponsored by the centenary of Canberra, which is an initiative of the, of the ACT government. And this year, the awards will adopt a Canberra theme to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Australia's capital city in a venue that acknowledges the vital role of journalism in democracy, we hope. Uh, also in Canberra is a special edition of the annual Walkley's Media Conference, two days of workshops and panels discussions with leading Australians and international speakers on November 29th and 30th. So please pop on the website at walkleys.com and register your interest or download a program form. Uh, and so that we do hope that you can make the conference. Uh, and we know that you will enjoy tonight's discussion and our esteemed panellists. But before I leave you, one final note. I wish to remind you all that the announcement of this year's Walkley Awards finalists will be Thursday the 18th of October, so be sure to check the website for the full list of finalists. I will now hand you over with great pleasure to my colleague Matt Fallon from The Edge. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, I'm Matt Fallon, Execu Acting Executive Manager of The Edge, and uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered here today, the Turrbal and the Yuggera people, and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, The Edge, as part of the State Library of Queensland, is a creative space for, where young people aged 15 to 25 creatively experiment across art, science, technology and enterprise. Presently, The Edge is exploring uh, the programming theme, Cosmology, and a highlight of the program has been our popular Astro Fashion Workshop series that sees participants learning about the universe at the same time as making a fashionable pair of tights made from images from the sky. And you're in luck, I'm not actually wearing a pair of those tights tonight, so um, that's, uh, that, that can just stay between me and, me and the mirror. Now, hosting a program like Citizen J here at the Edge uh, highlights the important role that libraries play in the information industry. Libraries are about their users and the stories that are contained within. Um, they're also safe places to ask questions and discuss important issues like we're doing here tonight. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the partners that are supporting this venture. Mr Tim Fairfax, who generously supported the Citizen J program through the Queensland Library Foundation. Our event partners, the Walkley Media, uh, the, the Walkley Foundation and the Media and Entertainment Arts Alliance. Uh, the community radio stations 4ZZZ and 4EB and our training partners, the, uh, the Community Media Training Organisation, goodness, and Afters, Afters Open. There are a number of aspects to the Citizen J program. A newsroom has been established here at the edge. Some content has been, um, has, has been put out front, which you may have seen on your way in. And you can take a tour of that tonight, so, so please feel free after, um, after this, uh, this, this interesting discussion to take a quick look. And four casual newsroom facilitator roles have also been offered uh, for, for further professional development for young and emerging journalists. A custom check-in system has also been developed to coordinate program participants, allowing them to remain virtually connected to participants across multiple sites simultaneously. And the Citizen J Experiments Competition. This is an opportunity for journalists, developers, entrepreneurs and innovators to, to apply for up to $10,000 to create new platforms or content for the media industry. There's some flyers for that one at the front desk, so please grab one on the way out if you're interested. Uh, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the panellists and the expertise that they bring here tonight. And um, I think the representation from the organisations, ABC Open, Brisbane Times, Girl with a Satchel and ABC Radio National is, is really quite a testament to the... Uh, I guess, the, the importance of the, the ideas that are being discussed here. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Anthony Fennell from ABC's Future Tense program and our chairperson for this evening's panel to the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. 
as you just heard, I'm Anthony Fennell, and uh, I'm the author of this fantastic journalistic tome, which is out now, uh, available through HarperCollins and ABC Books. It's called The Future and Related Nonsense. And I also present uh, the Future Tense series on ABC Radio National, or RN, as we now call ourselves. I used to be the uh, presenter of the Media Report a couple of years ago, which is one of the reasons I've, uh, I've been asked along today. And uh, I do a lot of coverage on my program, Future Tense, of the way we're changing the, in the, the digital world and uh, the effect that's having on our society and the way we communicate with each other. Uh, by way of background, I'm a Walkley Award-winning journalist and broadcaster, and uh, I've had over 20 years' experience working with both television and radio. Uh, before I introduce our panel, I'll just uh, refresh your memory about the question for this particular session. It is, but is it journalism? And you may have read the blurb for this evening's event already. If you haven't, uh, it reads like this. Blogs are a lot like the existing media. They cover a wide range of topics for all sorts of audiences, present a diversity of opinions and vary greatly in their writing and content styles. Like websites, blogs have evolved from pure, purely word and picture-based publications to include audio, video and more. But is it journalism? Where do blogs fit in the news media ecosystem? Now, we will be taking some questions from the audience and also the people who are joining us on webcam, if they have a phone or they're connected to a computer. We're only taking those questions via Twitter, so if you want to uh, ask a question tonight, you need to use the hashtag hashwalkleys, and uh, we'll come to those throughout the night as they come in on my iPad, which is just here. Let me quickly introduce our panellists before we get into the discussion. Salua Middleton, down the end there, is an experienced print and television journalist, and she's worked as a music journalist and as a researcher on a feature film. She's also worked for both the Curry Mail newspaper and as a video journalist for NITV, the National Indigenous Television. Salua established the monthly Indigenous newspaper called Be Counted and self-published 14 editions. She was also one of, or she is also one of the first producers employed by ABC Open and still works for ABC Open. She's also one of the presenters of their television show, which screens on ABC News 24 each Friday night. Erica Bartle has worked in media for 10 years, beginning in advertising before moving into magazine publishing and then online. She's blogged under the Girl with a Satchel banner for more than five years, and she describes the experience, perhaps you could tell us about this, Erica, a little bit later on, as both rewarding and debilitating. Uh, Erica supplements her online work with a role in communications for a not-for-profit organisation and also by tutoring at the Queensland University of Technology. And for those of you who don't know, who haven't seen the blog, Girl with a Satchel unpacks culture, faith, feminism, media and social justice issues. And our final guest is, is Kat Feeney. Kat is a journalist, blogger, occasional dramaturge and student anthropologist. And she writes about urban affairs for the Brisbane Times. But Kat is probably best known as a commentator on sex, love, dating and relationships via her popular blog, City Cat. Launched in 2007, the blog is now published across all major mastheads in the Fairfax Digital, I was going to say Empire, but network is probably, probably more appropriate these days. Uh, as a founding member of uh, the Brisbane Times, Kat has filled various positions, and these have included uh, manning the breaking news desk and developing video and multimedia projects. Now, to the questions. Um, we want this to be a lively discussion. Uh, so I'm going to actually kick it off with a bit of a contentious statement and say that I personally think that the central question for this session, but is it journalism, is a confused and out-of-date piece of nonsense. And I'd say that, I'd say it's confused because it equates journalism with news media as though uh, non-news media is not journalism and out-of-date because it seems to me that it doesn't recognise that even mainstream media organisations these days have been blogging for a very, very long time. A far better question, I would probably say, would be what value does the blog form offer journalism or what constitutes an effective journalistic blog? But nevertheless, let's, let's get to all of those issues, but let's start with this idea of are blogs, are they actually journalism? Uh, Kat, you're a paid professional journalist. Mm -hmm. When you're blogging for Fairfax, do you take off your journalistic hat or is it still well and truly on your head? Oh, it's certainly well and truly on my head and I'd like to... Uh 
I guess, begin by agreeing completely with your statement uh, in opening this discussion. But I suppose uh, where I come from, where I'm blogging, is a place um, that I come from when I'm being a journalist as an urban affairs reporter, and that is I'm aiming to investigate and report and share news and trends and explore ideas uh, with an audience. And I guess the word explore is particularly key here because I'm uh, a digital journalist. I work in the online world. And um, it's very much a participatory platform whereby if I have a you know, council budget story and we enable comments, there's still room for discussion with readers. And as much as I write a blog about the latest sex trends and open uh, for comment, and there's uh, plenty of room for intercourse with the, uh, the readers there, but uh, slightly different uh, characteristics. So I think, yes, uh, I definitely uh, consider myself a journalist when I'm both um, reporting, if you like, and blogging. It's a curious thing, isn't it, when you're doing, if you were doing news reporting, just straight news reporting on, say, City Hall matters for the Brisbane Times, you were then asked to uh, write about travel, say, for the Brisbane Times. Mm. Nobody would suggest that your travel writing was not journalism, would they? Exactly, yeah. And I think that's also interesting because, um, you know, through the Brisbane Times, I've been an um, entertainment reporter, entertainment editor, fashion reporter. Um, I did restaurant reviewing last year for the launch of our Good Food Guide. So I've really worn, if we're talking again about the hats, every single hat there is to wear in the newsroom. And I just feel as though blogging is another... Uh, I don't necessarily think it's a separate hat. In some senses, it's just the method of delivery. But if, you know, for the purpose perhaps of this panel discussion... Um, as a blogger as well, and, and I'm not really sure if there's a, a, a distinction here. Yeah. Uh, Salua Middleton, I noticed uh, this afternoon that you posted about today's panel discussion on the ABC Open website. I've been watching. <laughs> Good. Uh, and you, you asked people whether, in fact, they thought blogging was journalism. Tell us about some of the responses that you got. Yeah, look, I got... Um, I, and I also tweeted it as well, and some people were like, well, no, it's not. Um, but I think the main consensus was that it depends who's delivering it and whether they've taken into consideration, you know, the values that a journalist would apply to making um, making a story or delivering content. So I think the, also the consensus was that a blogger isn't a journalist, but a blogger can create a story that has journalism merits in it. So once again, as, as Kat was saying, the, <laughs> the blog is a platform really, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's just the platform. The question then is, who is the journalist? That's right. And I don't necessarily think that my blogs that I deliver through ABC, even though I'm a trained journalist, I don't necessarily think that my blogs are journalism um, or journalist, journalistic pieces, although I do try and apply you know, everything that I've learned in all my training to those blogs to develop, um, to create a a piece of content that is, you know, fair and accurate and all those things. But um, I see them as kind of like opinion and experience and, you know, exploring ideas and engaging with people. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, they, I might have one or two blogs that do have, that I would consider journalism. But I guess opinion journalism is a very well-established mm. form of journalism. I feel it's just, just because it's not in ink and on paper next to a little head, yeah. does it make it any less so? And I think one of the big problems is certainly with um, online journalism, which was already, which was met with raised eyebrows when we first started and people didn't quite get the concept and carries over to perhaps some of this, um, for want of a better word, snobbery on behalf of some people in regards to whether or not blogging is or isn't, is that it's the fact that there's all of a sudden this wall was broken down between the, the reader and the content maker or perceived to be broken down. I mean, essentially there was the subject or the idea that all of a sudden on the web, on the web, Anyone could be a journalist, anyone could have an opinion, and we'd be putting those opinions up on the same level as people who had spent years training to form and earn the right for an opinion and be published in a newspaper. Yeah. And I think that participatory aspect of it as well has, has helped cloud the issue. And I think perhaps that's starting to settle down as people realise that there's just as much gate keep, gatekeeping that can be applied in online news media in as much as there can be in uh, blogging, you know. And, and that's America. what I hope yeah. to kind of do with my work with ABC Open is, you know, it's user-generated content and, you know, I hope that that I'm able to, I guess, transfer and hand over those skills to people who want to, who, who want to, um, you know, write a blog and want to um, learn those, you know, methods that we've learned as journalists. 
and help them apply that to their writing and their blogs. And Erica, just bringing you in here, um, I, had, uh, I did an interview recently with somebody about authenticity in politics and the point that this person made was that uh, the, the public pretty quickly smell a fake in politics. What, you know, when they get to a certain level, you don't have to tell the public really that this person is not authentic. They get it. Is it a bit the same with journalism? I mean, do, we, do some of us in the profession worry too much about uh, citizen journalism and blogging and whether it's journalism or not? Do the public basically go out there and look and say, OK, this blog is journalism, I get that. This blog is not journalism, I get that. And perhaps like both of them for different reasons. Mm. I think a couple of things there. Something Kat touched on just before was this idea of, um, you know, the internet, what we've been online for 20 years, maybe seriously, um, but the Australian Financial Review only went on, online like 10 years ago. And so the, the journalism world has been playing this game of catch-up and, and the bloggers have been doing it all the while. So I think that there was this, you know, derision about it, this, this a lot of scepticism about whether what, what was being seen online was actually journalism or whether it was just a bunch of pasty-faced university students in, in their bedrooms. Um, but, but since those days, I think that there's been a bit of a, um, you know, a, a washing out. Of, of lots of blogs have, have fallen away, either because they can't keep up the pace, and I mm. certainly found that as an independent blogger, that, well, what is the point of me competing with the likes of news.com.au or, or any of the blogs that are more highly staffed or when the news organisations start and the magazines, and the magazine industry has been very slow to catch on, when they started to get the idea that they needed to be online, uh, lots of the bloggers lost some of their readership. Um, so then you have to sit back and start questioning, well, what are my strengths and what areas of, of journalism or what areas of public discussion might I specialise in? Um, and that's certainly been the approach that I've taken. Um, in regards to... Uh, I, th I think that... Blogging has very much, maybe to its detriment, helped shape the course of the current political discourse in the country, and it's not been to our benefit, perhaps. In what sense? In the sense that, um, you know, it's been reduced to very short, pithy statements that are kind of link-bait and perhaps not well thought out enough. And uh, you've got to wonder about the link between public policy and short-termism. And, and the nature of online media also, because it, it very much seems like politics is accommodating media as opposed to the other way around. No, no, one one uh, comment I heard recently from somebody was that uh, they thought actually Twitter had done that, in a sense, to blogs, that blogs were a lot better before social media came along, that, so, that well, blog social media, but before microblogging came along, that mm -hmm. microblogging has basically, within the Australian context at least, led to the death of long-form blogging, whether that's correct or not. Mm. Um, yeah, well, I just think Pat. it's interesting because it's not, you know, cars don't kill people, people kill people. And uh, in as much as blogging is um, a method of delivering um, whatever content, it's still driven by the blogger. In as much as Twitter is a platform that is restricted to 140 character or less bytes, but it's still people who are using Twitter, not Twitter itself, that is creating or change. And so I feel whenever we're talking about, you know, is this, like, what's the causality here? I think, yes, on one hand, you could suggest that some of these new platforms have helped shape people's uh, focus and the way they engage with ideas and the way they engage with each other. But by the same token, it's also the audience demand and what the audience is wanting and what the people are seeking out and what the people are wanting. Yes. So and it really I, is kind I, of... I can tell you, having worked uh, for uh, Australia Talks for a couple of years, which uh, uh, sadly um, met its demise last year, but was a, a, a talkback, an intelligent talkback program on Radio National, um, for a long time before microblogging or blogs came along, people were very rude in their comments when they rang on the telephone. Mm. Uh, so in, in one sense, blogging and microblogging has really just exacerbated that, hasn't it? It's given more opportunity, more avenues for people to get rude, I guess. 
Because there aren't those gatekeepers like Kat was talking about, um, you know, there is no middleman. Like I don't have uh, sub-editors and uh, deputy editors checking the work that, that I put out there, so I've got to put in my own checks and balances before I hit the publish button. Um, but in, in terms of what you were saying, Kat, I think there was a study done by the University of Oregon and, and they found that um, levels of empathy have actually decreased amongst people uh, in general over the past 30 years and, and more so in the past 10 years. So I, I think that social media really is having an impact on our ability, not only in other studies have been done to show that, that we no longer have the same thought processes, mm -hmm. that um, we are tempted to, to say the first thing that, that comes out of our mouth, which is why I'm very wary of things like this because <laughs> you never know what you might say. Sure. I guess uh, can I just jump in and just say if you do want to ask a question of uh, anyone on the panel, uh, the hashtag is hash walkleys. So send us a question, a question, hash walkleys. Kat, sorry, you're going to... Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, yeah, and I completely hear where you're coming from. And I, I guess I could quote you as at various other studies, you know, that would suggest the opposite. That's the wonderful world of academia for you. But I suppose when you look at how, if we're talking social media, how that's been latched onto by the not-for-profit and the community sector and social causes and social justice and the ways that charities have been able to use tweeting, for example, to put out a really short, sharp message. I'm not going to go to Coney. I'm not going to go there. But I, I still think that you can't necessarily say these new platforms and the new ways that we are doing things has essentially and irrevocably altered human nature. I just think that's a very long bow to draw. And I had to question who's paying for some of the studies and what is their sample group. And I, I just uh, think... You know. So, Lua, just in terms of uh, that, the sort of, again, I suppose the authenticity factor for blogging, um, I trawled around today and there was a tweet from somebody who said that they felt blogs were more believable, was the word that they use, than mainstream media. And that was something I, I remember when I was doing Media Report, when blogs had really just come on board. There was a feeling that blogs were, blogs were more grassroots. They were, they were real. But like everything, I guess, like, like rock and roll back in the 50s, there's a time when it's amateur, then it gets co-opted by everyone and, and by the big media players, by the big money. Is that feeling of um, believability for most people with blogs today, is that gone in a sense? Or how has that changed now that blogs have become so mainstream? Well, I think, I think you know, we're, we tend to believe what's written is true. And then I guess when you see something that's written by somebody, as you say, from the grassroots level, it has to be true. You know, it, you know, you, you strike it because it's coming from a person and not from, you know, a journalist who sometimes, um, you know, look like demons, um, <laughs> demonised a bit. So, hearing it from a grassroots person personalises it, and you know, it strikes a chord with people. People can identify with maybe what they're saying in their. I'd say. I don't know. I think I think that people still. I guess I I think people that still think that um, blogging, in microblogging and putting it out there, you know, it, it, that it is true and and mm. that they it is believable. I think people, as much as I don't always want to say it, <laughs> yep. but I do I do think that people think it is you know more believable than sometimes because it's coming from the ground. It's coming from it seemed to be yeah, coming from, from ground there. zero. Uh, Erica, is that is that an issue? Do you think? Do you do you notice that? Because blogs, say your blog is is a very personal uh, blog, isn't it? In lots of ways. So yeah. that person personal side of it often carries with it a kind of you know speaking from the heart. It does very earnestly. Um, sometimes to other people's pain. Um, I, I, I've really pulled back from the more personal uh, elements of it. So really, it, it, I suppose it's more like, you know, you, you open your, your Weekend Australian magazine and you've got your feature articles, you've got your editorial, you've got your Philip Adams column and, and your recipes and whatnot. To me, that is kind of the what a good blog should be. It should be kind of a, a mix of, of content and material. Um, in terms of uh, how I shape articles, they're very much um, written through my, my worldview, my ideological slant, but so is everything in The Australian, mm. so is everything in The Sydney Morning Herald. Um, so I think that that's a really kind of a, a fine line there. And, and again, it, it probably comes across as, as more personal. I, you know, I wish I had a sub-editor to pay to 
to kind of curb my really verbose and 3,000 word essays, which I'm sure very few people read, but um, it still feels in a sense like that there's a contribution there, perhaps there is some value to be gleaned. But why, sorry, just picking up, why do you, why do you feel the need to pull back in a sense from the personal? Does it feel uh, that in giving that personal side you're not being journalistic? Ah, see, with your own blog it, it's probably a bit easier to, to be personal, to be real, but I think we went through this phase of, you know, oh, let's all be authentic and all air our dirty laundry online, that confessional style, exactly. And, you know, people get hurt and I don't know that it's it's um, always valuable um, to other people. So I think you've got to have a level of um, maturity, which I probably didn't have when I first started blogging, to know when to, you know, what to share, what not to share. And unfortunately then what, what you are putting out there is more edited because you're not giving away everything. You're not public property. Um, but you need to, to do those checks and balances to, to ensure your longevity in the profession as well as giving it a, a tone of some credibility. You're not just out there pimping your life to get links, um, you know, to get hits. Now, Kat, I have to bring you in here because you get credibility from being enormously personal at times, don't you, <laughs> with, your, uh, with your blog, mm. with CityCat. Uh, yes, and I think, but I also get credibility with CityCat initially because I'm, you know, endorsed by the powers that be at Fairfax. Um, so I also have a personal blog, which isn't, but uh, you could say now, because I started off as a pro blogger, whether or not, you know, that sort of spills over to any legitimacy I might have on my Tumblr. But are there, is there a limit given that? Given that you've, as you say, you've, you've been given that kind of endorsement, if you like, mm. that imprimatur mm. from the bigger organisation. Yeah. They want you to say the sort of things that you say, but but do mm. you draw a line and say, okay, this is where I know I can't I can't go past? That that's interesting. I think it wouldn't be a line. <sighs> It would be a line, obviously, because I'm endorsed and backed by Fairfax, I would still have to comply with the um, code, you know, so there's that line, obviously. Yep. Um, I also would then have to consider my position as a staff employee, and then I'd also have to consider more about the content. And obviously, I could go really in the direction that was hyper, hyper personal, as long as it was still within the style and the tone and the flavour that Fairfax was happy to publish. You know, there would be... I could write a confessional style sex blog where I go really, really in depth, in depth. And I've considered about, you know, going down that track. I guess the thing that does hold me back is simply the fact that um, I just don't want to put it all out there always. And I think you just do. And this is something that I think relates to anyone who's um, using the internet and, and using social media especially, that we still need to be thinking about how we can be gatekeepers of our own content. If we're self-publishing, and we're talking about self-publishing now, and this is certainly a conversation that's very topical right now, and particularly in regards to um, some of the stories we've had about trolling, and just when you are, how are you engaging with the web, and how are you aware of what you're putting out there, who's reading it, and whether it's going to come back to you. So I think it's that self-moderation and self-regulation um, that factors into it as well. Well, I have to say, I work for Radio National, so we're the beacon of self, uh, self-moderation. self I'd say we're, we're buttoned up. We're not, we're not putting any of it out there. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, look, let's just take a couple of, of questions. Um, one person has, uh, has tweeted here, uh, what's the value of user-generated content in mainstream news environments? But bringing that, that back to blogs, one of the things that we have noticed about blogs really in recent times is that they've gone from being mostly Word to incorporating video, audio, all sorts of things, but also to incorporating user-generated content from other people. You know, it's not just necessarily about you. It's about giving others a platform to come in. Uh, Salua, maybe you could take a, a start off on that. Yeah, OK. Um... Look, I think there's a great benefit, I mean, especially what I do with Open, you know, it's all about getting that user-generated content and show, showcasing those stories. And I guess it's the community is able to now, you know, with, with, with the internet, with the web and being able to self-publish, um, people are able to just publish their stories, but user-generated content means that, you know, we can hear these stories that we may not necessarily hear in mainstream news. It means those stories that are gold, in gold, little gold nuggets in our communities do get to see the light of day now because because there are so many platforms for for this content to appear on. So I think I think there's um, 
a definite benefit for the community as a whole. It makes the community richer. We understand our communities a lot better. We understand each other better. We understand what it makes each other tick and, you know, hopefully that it, it can, you know, empower communities and people. And there has been for quite some time now, hasn't there, uh, an issue about mainstream media pulling out of local communities. They talk a lot about serving the local community, but certainly in non-metropolitan Australia, for at least a decade, they've been stripping their resources out and basically just um, uh, you know, providing stuff, casting out from the centre, from Sydney or Brisbane, mm -hmm. and doing that in radio and with newspapers, a lot more syndication. So in that sense, does what you're doing, what you're, the, the people who generate material for ABC Open, is what they're doing in a sense trying to fill some of that gap? Oh, look, I, 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 well, I don't feel like the media, media professionals should be threatened by user-generated content and, um, you know, non-media professionals creating really valuable, beautiful, amazing, great stories. Um, I don't think we should be threatened by that. I think, you know, media is evolving and, and you know, we, we've got to keep up with it now. The journalists, the media makers, the content makers, we have to keep up with it and this is the way it is. People are, are not sourcing their stories just from the news. They're sourcing it from, you know, blogs, from Vimeo, from um, Flickr in all kinds of different ways. So, you know, like it's about us keeping up as well, me media keeping up with with the trends and, and with as well. The, and with the fact that people want a, a plural, plurality of, uh, of sources. They don't necessarily want the ABC or the, uh, Fairfax newspapers. They want no, that's right. And stories can be told in a number of different ways. Uh, the interesting question here. Uh, some industries, this person has tweeted, some industries such as the open source tech community rely on blogs for day-to-day -day problem solving and sharing. Are blogs more relevant to some topics than others? And certainly, I know in the tech field, the technology sector is full of blogs. Mm. Fashion, beauty, reviews, criticisms as well. And I think that's another point that we should be making in terms of, you know, thinking about well, if blog is more of a blogging is more of a platform delivery rather than a particular thing, like a particular style of reportage, for example, then you have to consider it in its entirety. And that is stuff like, I mean, fashion and beauty blogs. They might not be coming across as you would read editorial in Vogue, but let's look at circulation figures in Vogue and some, like user numbers for fashion blogs around Australia. I mean, clearly there's a huge market for it and people are really responding to it. And I think those kind of blogs um, are perfectly legitimate, excellent experiences and you know, journalism to a degree, but you wouldn't exactly put them in the same basket as, uh, I don't know, HuffPo or you know, something like that that does have this other legitimacy thing. So I think, yeah, so it's, it's totally... I mean, you would know this as someone with a niche category as well who's... Yeah, I mean, I, I look at sites like The Conversation. I mm. think how, how brilliant because you're getting those kind of expert academic opinions. Um, obviously, they're edited, though, because I think most of us know that lots of academics talk in very yeah, verbose style and would probably take about, you know, a, a few days to get around to making a point, um, just like me right now. But um, I think there is a lot of value to be gleaned from, yeah, business people and, and experts in their fields taking to the blogging platform to share their opinions. You know, I, I visit certain economists online to get uh, their point of view on, um, on the matters that we're reading about in, in the papers. So, um, and, and I was talking to Sula before, you know, sometimes when you're researching a piece, you Google and, and you, you come up with an, an expert's blog or, you know, a, a, a university paper mm. um, and, and you, you reference these materials, but then it comes back to knowing what to use and what not to use. And, and trusted, uh, that issue of trusted sources again, in a sense, isn't it? I mean, you, the conversation you mentioned you can look at that and you know, in a sense, where it's coming from, what its particular biases might be, that it's put together by academics uh, who've got their own issues to peddle. That's not necessarily, and you can judge them whether you accept that or not or how you read it, that's not necessarily the case, though, with a lot of, of blogs, though, is it? It's very... And people often get caught out uh, when you find out they've accepted... I know this is the case in the technology field. You find out they've accepted... Um, gifts, uh, you know, gratis from uh, from review. corporations, yeah. and haven't disclosed that in a, you know, mm. as you would be expected to disclose it if you were a journalist, practicing journalist. And that's Can the danger. Yeah. Sorry, Anthony, no, um, but right. of this whole idea of the commercialisation of of blogs, and um, 
particularly people who um, might not have you know, a strong media background or a media degree, and this is not to be snobbish, but just not having those skills to, um, to be able to say, well, this is how this might affect the credibility or the authenticity of what I'm trying to produce as a product, and, and um, it might compromise my editorial in some way. So is there an issue there? Is one of the difficulties for um, starting a blog you start a blog and you want to be a journalist. You want to adopt a journalistic attitude to that blog, a journalistic approach. Is one of the problems then, if you're not connected to a mainstream organisation or a university, training? You know, how do you learn the, the sort of issues that make you a journalist, the sort of things you need to do to make you a, an accountable journalist? Is that possibly an issue? Sula had like the reverse experience, didn't you? Because you had to learn how to be a blogger. Yeah, that's right. I wasn't comfortable skills. with being a, a blogger because <laughs> I was a journalist. And you actually said today on online that you you didn't actually believe that blog, blogging was journalism initially. No, that's right. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm leaning towards like I, I believe that some forms of blogging is journalism, but I don't necessarily believe that all bloggers are journalists. Mm. <laughs> And like I said before, you know, I don't believe that most of my blogs that I put out through ABC Open is journalism. Now, here's or, a bit... or, you know, like in, in the strict sense of how I know it and have experienced it. Here's a question for any of the three of you to pick up. What then makes a journalist? I mean, it might, a journalist might, being a journalist might seem like a very obvious thing. Mm. But I was recounting uh, earlier to Erica that a lot of people I know who do journalistic work uh, often do journalistic work for no pay because they're coming, they're on maternity leave and they want to keep their hand in, say, mm -hmm. or they're trying to get back in the industry from having come from somewhere else, or they do it for very, very low rates of pay. Mm. So it's obviously not being paid that makes you a journalist. Radio National, you would think, is a, a, a doyon of journalism excellence, but I can tell you at least probably half the staff at Radio National who put programs together never trained in journalism school, never worked in a newsroom. Mm -hmm. They came in as producers, as academics, and learnt the craft there. So what does make us a, what does make a journalism? Well, I think, I mean, a lot a of journalist. it is intent, surely. I mean, if you're intending to be a journalist and you understand what that aspire, the aspirations associated with that, um, and then to some degree it's, well, you're a journalist and other people will have to make a decision whether or not they agree or not. And I suppose it's how other people are judging you that we're talking about here. And so I feel, I mean, if we want to talk broadly, uh, throw a definite, I mean, how do you define journalism? I, I guess it could, it, it's, it's about um, reporting and investigating news ideas and trends and sharing them with an audience with a view to be balanced and search for the truth. I guess that's how I might throw a net over the huge... You know, and accountability sprawling. does that have, does that come well, in? Yeah, I think yeah and to, certainly the integrity. Yeah, know. I think you have to like have a grasp of of those. You know, like you know, ethics in journalism. I think you have to have a clear grasp of that. And you know, just because you're able to self-publish doesn't mean you're a journalist. So where do we? This is a term I really dislike. I have to I have to confess, citizen journalism, because uh, it just it is so it's such a pompous term. Where then does citizen journalism come in? Because why do we keep why do we keep so many of us in the industry keep making this distinction between citizen journalists and journalists? Because so many of us in the industry are worried that we're going to lose our jobs. Because this is the fact. I mean, these words, blogging and citizen journalism, and this language was created by people involved in an industry that was going through and is going through tumultuous change. There was a need to identify and say, right, that's the problem. That, those, those bloggers are going to kill newspapers or, you know, those citizen journalis journalists are going to destroy the news model. I mean, it's completely inaccurate and it sets up again. It, that's what's feeding into this false dichotomy that we began with at the start. I mean, I don't feel as if... I mean, what is a citizen... I mean, that's... I think it I also feel... means so that you have to question the credibility um, sometimes of, or, or you know, um, you know, as a, you know, as a journalist, well, as a journalist that I think that I am, I'd, I'd like people to take me ser more serious than a citizen journalist, but still value the citizen journalist's journalist content. But um, you know, where there's flags raised, you know, have to question that. I've seen a lot of stuff being published and and gone. Well, that's just. It's like a witch. It's something to turn into a witch hunt that but, could be a But is a that just because they're not doing journalism 
well enough or is that because they are a separate category? They are yeah, citizens. Because they don't have a grasp on any of those things that we just spoke about. Like. Uh, there's a question here. Why should legitimacy be determined by whether you're part of a paid publication? Well, I think we've just determined that it, 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 it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. No, it, shouldn't. it isn't. No. Uh, another question. Kat, to you. Uh, somebody's tweeted, how much revision would one of Kat's posts go through at Fairfax? <laughs> Could always go through more. Um, but, I mean, nothing's ever perfect, and perfection is an illusion. Um, so I guess that's the answer to the question. It's so dependent on so many factors, how much revision. In the, before I post, I certainly revise my ideas to varying degrees. Sometimes I have a, a great topic that I'll sit down and research over a few days. Other times it's a real kind of spew of ideas that I'll put together. So, you know, if we're talking about my internal revision, it, it varies in as much as um, revision down the track, I guess. Yeah. External the question revision. was, what about, what about external revision? Do you mean from, from uh, readers or from, from, readers, from comments or? coming in? Edit, is there any editing from external sources? Uh, well, we edit in-house, and oftentimes it'll be edited as an ongoing basis because I suppose there's really the entry component and responses. So the editing exists as part of the moderating as well. Um, if that, yeah. Erica, just moving on to a, another issue, as a, talk to us about the money side of it because if you're not tied to a major organisation, you've got to fund yourself, haven't you? And uh, quality journalism is hard enough to do and make, make money out of it these days. How do you, how do you juggle that when you're, when you're by yourself and you're trying to produce quality content on a blog? Yes, this is why I have another part-time job. Because, uh, I mean, for, for a time in the, you know, heady days when blogging was all new and fantastic, I did have some advertising and I was probably, you know, I wasn't making a profit by any means. Um, but for some reason I, um, I thought there was some value to what I was doing. In retrospect, it probably wasn't. Um, Commercialisation can be a, a really tricky thing because in one sense it gives you legitimacy because, you know, um, and this is something that newspapers are, are struggling with at the moment, you know, you can't produce journalism for free. It is really, really bloody expensive, um, particularly if you, you're wanting to incorporate images and, and video and whatnot. The scary thing, and getting back to citizen journalism, is that, you know, newspaper publishers aren't stupid. Um, if they want to, if they're seeing that the public is enjoying citizen journalism, then it makes sense for them to co-opt the public to help them produce. Like, obviously, the ABC has no commercial, well, it has a commercial agenda, but it's essentially a, a public owned good, but commercial enterprises like in News Limiteds and near Fairfaxes, um, you know, they need to prove to advertisers that they have eyeballs on their ads um, and, and so will co-opt the, the citizen journalism to their benefit. Like, uh, it's, it's all very high and mighty. Like, everyone's got to earn a living, don't we, at the end of the day. So uh, the, the path that you choose to take to, to pay the food bills is, is something that you've got to negotiate. Um, it, I think it comes back to motive again. You know, my motive for blogging is to explore some issues for a uh, select readership, um, most of whom share my worldview, um, just like most, you know, kind of tight publications. And is that, is that the case? I mean, with most blogs? Are most blogs not broad in their appeal? Are they not trying to be broad? Uh, are most blogs that you come across really trying to narrow down to a very defined audience? I think niche is, is a particular expertise of blogs, and that's why you see the likes of mainstream media journalists um, you know, like your your Georges, who have their economics blogs because... George Mendel Genius. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, the publication sees some value in, um, you know, these talking heads having an, an online um, kind of enterprise because that's interesting to people and they're, they're, they're the experts So, and they do have that credibility, so, so we go to them. He, he's interesting, isn't he? Because George Megalogenis, people who don't know, is a, a senior economics writer for The Australian and politics, but mostly economics and politics through an economic uh, lens. Uh, when you look at his blog, he, he really seems to use it almost as a spillover for ideas, 
but also as a way of engaging. Uh, it, that's his way of talking to the audience and getting, getting their ideas back. It's a moderated blog. But he, he, he does seem to, it's almost like he, he throws out a thought and then wants some of the input back and then that's how he incorporates that into his, his wider thinking. I love that you use the word engaging as well because I think that's one of the key aspects that we've sort of been touching around here and, um, and that is the idea of a blog existing as something that well, initially when it started, it wasn't just... It was a, it's a portmanteau, obviously, of web log. And so it initially was uh, live journal, diary style, this is my day, this is what I was doing. And then it would be thrown over to comments and then people would respond to comments and then a discussion began. So then sort of blogging, and that's certainly the way that I look at my CityCat blog, is it's a discussion. I'm sort of putting out a topic out there and then I'm engaging with readers and then it's an ongoing thing. And so there is... I mean, do you classify then the commenters as citizen journalists because they're working with me as journalists to create a piece of content that is published across the... You know, or, and this is where I kind of feel like um, maybe we don't really need to be so particular about how we're trying to classify different aspects of what maybe is all really kind of the same thing. But, so, so, um, so Lua... Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that there are benefit. I mean, it sounds a bit like we're like, oh, you know, we are the journalists and they are the bloggers. But um, there is value too in there is a more value in um, having bloggers. Like at, at the moment, we we just launched a new project that's all about blogging. But we've engaged one of our most prolific bloggers to come on as a lead moderator. So she's been engaged with this project to be one of the lead moderators because. She's such a great blogger and engages with the com community. And, you know, there's that word engagement again. And so, you know, if she she's a writer, she's, um, you know, a blogger and, you know, she gets out in the community, but it's a good path for her to start if she wants to do journalism and create this um, journalism pieces, you know, for her to start gaining that credibility. So, mm -hmm. you know, blogging has got her foot in the door to an organisation where many dream of and, and it can being a part of. it can sometimes uh, lead you right up to the top, can't it? Because there's a fellow in the United States named Matt Silver, who, a, a bit like Megalogenus, who's a, an economics nut, uh, this guy's a statistics nut, uh, and he had a, a blog called 538, which he still has, uh, which he started up independently, which was then picked up by the New York... Uh, times, which many would consider not a bad pickup. Mm. Um, so it, it is, in a sense, isn't it? Blogging can be a way of almost acting the same way that uh, young journalists used to put together a show reel mm. in the old days. It's a way of showing, yes, I've got talent. I may not be fully formed as a journalist, but here's the talent, here's my potential. Certainly. So it's like the X Factor. You might, yeah, <laughs> roll up for the auditions. But then, you know, not everyone is cut out to be in the music business. And, you know, I personally was always more comfortable being a deputy editor than I, I could never have seen myself in, in an editor role because, you know, it's quite a different role. So I think you've got to be wise about choosing whether you see yourself as a writer, contributor, whether you can take on the responsibility of having a blog yourself because there is that accountability that comes with it. Um, but I think training programs for, for bloggers like um, a QT, uh, generally we do talk about, about blogging as part of the, the journalistic program, but, you know, they're, they're also learning the who, what, when, where, why of basic news writing as well. So I think they go hand in hand. But these days, uh, young journalists need to be trained across all all platforms, oh, how, totally. to, how to write for all genres. Yeah, well, I've been doing workshops with, like, a university group and as you know, and incorporated ABC Open and the projects as part of their subject. And what I've done is I've said, OK, I want you to do this project. It's just a photo project, but what I want you to do, I want you to do a blog, I want you to do an online story, I want you to make a video. And it's about, you know, we've got to be everywhere. Um, and people, people want information, consume, consume stories and information in so many different ways. Some might read the paper, but some might only consume their news and, and stories through and online. And a photo can be information, can't it, for somebody? Yeah. It's not, yeah. we, we have a, you know, you can have an old-fashioned idea that it's only just uh, print articles, you know, but mm. a photo in the modern world can be, uh, can be information for somebody that, that could be vital or necessary for them. 
Certainly. And I mean, is my Instagram account a photo blog? I mean, this is some of the other... I'm interested, Sula, actually, when you're going out and training and saying, can you deliver me this, this, this types of content, how do you distinguish between a blog and a news story? Um, I get them to apply um, what they've learned in the previous subjects before they come to me. Yeah. Um, everything that they've learned about writing a, writing a news story. So they cover it um, in a way... Um, you know, in a news kind of sense or a typical um, article. And then a blog, I want them to talk about their experience of doing this story, any challenges, anything that, you know, has come out of it, anything quirky. Mm. And it's all about teaching them and showing them that you can have um, one story but you should be able to repurpose it so many different ways and value add to to your stories because that's what people want. People may not just... Con- people might miss your story if you don't have it here and they might miss it if you don't have it here so cross your t's dot your eyes <laughs> now we're far, we're fast running out of time so I'll just we probably could squeeze in uh one or two more questions uh so hash walkleys is the uh, the tag to use if you want to send us a question a question that is here is does a journalist necessarily have a more informed opinion than a non-journalist i think we've already answered that really haven't we not necessarily so would we agree cat Yes, I mean, so the question's wording was, does, Do, a, does a journalist necessarily have a more informed opinion than a non-journalist? Not necessarily, not at all, no. in, in my opinion. No. Um, I want to just quickly talk, go back a tiny bit and talk about the value of the audience. We talked about engagement. Mm-hmm. How important is that audience? And when you're writing a blog, how should you, how should you view their comments and their input? Because it's easy to say that's great, that's the audience, that's what they're telling me, I should listen to them. Mm. But we all know in the media that there's this one nine ninety rule, that 1% contribute, 9% like to watch and occasionally contribute, and 90%, by and large, just like to just sit and watch. Mm. So, so you can often be talking about comments that an engagement that isn't necessarily representational of your broader audience. Is that the case? Well, I mean, yeah, I agree. And I think, I mean, if I look at the number of readers that I have per blog entry as compared to the number of comments that I might get, that ratio is probably about accurate. But, um, I I mean, when you're talking about engagement, this gets to the very heart of why I'm passionate about blogging and why I enjoy promoting it as something more than, you know, the bloggers. Because I feel like engagement is really striking at the heart of what journalism is. I mean, we tried to define journalism before, and I kind of gave you ideas about the activities that you do and some of the values that you have. But certainly one of the core values any journalist needs to have is engagement, particularly when you're engaging with people who are either your story or your audience. And so I feel like this is the real great strength of blogging and understanding blogging as an interactive format for journalism or one of the various ways you can repackage the same story. I mean, right at the heart of it certainly is engagement. So I think that's where looking at the the comments, but it'll also be the email exchange that you have with readers. Mm. You can see, you know, where they're coming from, their online. So there, there's so many forums that you can build up around it. So that's where I feel it, engagement it is, a, is, is There is a point there, isn't there? There is a... Um, there is a, a, a a criticism within the industry about online journalism that a lot of online journalists actually aren't out there engaging with people anymore. They're not going out to stories in the way that used, they used to. They're sitting in the office and repackaging, repurposing. Uh, so in that sense, does blogging allow you then to, as an online journalist, to, to actually have some form of engagement again? Uh, certainly. Um, and again, I mean, I feel like there is there was never no because I don't necessarily think that the, the popular pit- picture of an online journalist is completely accurate, speaking as, you know, someone who's worked in the first online (laughs) newsroom in the whole of the country. Um, But I think, like, on standalone online, I mean, obviously there's various online newsrooms. Um, But I guess the engagement that you can have online certainly is something that you use either as it is or something that you can find out a new hook or a new story and then follow up with a coffee and, you know, all your, your conventional news gathering techniques. I don't necessarily think that You know, it's the only way that we engage. I think it's still a very legitimate way to engage, but it's just one of several levels of engagement, if Uh, you like. Kat, with with my uh, radio program, we actually use Twitter a lot uh, Mm -hmm. to talk to the audience. And we, I mean, I think it's different for different programs. Twitter wouldn't work for all programs. For our program, because it's got such a tech focus, even though it's not a technology program, Twitter works very well. 
But again, you, uh, you know, I'm aware as a program maker that the people who engage with us, they're not representational of the broader audience for our program. What about yourself with your blog and, and how, much, uh, how much influence do they have over you and over the way you'll craft your blog over time? Yeah, I think it's such an interesting question because the majority of my readers are, are, are browsers and they're not highly engaged. And I think one of the dangers is when you start to cater content according to what is getting the most responses, you've got to sit back and do a check, you know, what's the motivation for garnering those kinds of responses and arguably, you know, the downfall of the news of the world was playing lowest common denominator journalism um, and it increasingly got worse and worse and worse and, you know, you've got a, a news team who are um, playing by rules that um, were a little bit dodgy. So I think... I think that we've definitely got to keep revisiting you know, what is the purpose, what's the end goal of journalism? Is it to create a healthier democracy? Is it to add to debate? Is it to tell the stories of people um, who, sto who don't have a voice, who, whose stories aren't being told, who aren't the mainstream? And I think we also have to remember who the majority of, you know, who the archetypal journalist is. They're, they're a highly um, educated most of the time or these days, um, you know, mostly middle class, you know, from, from similar backgrounds. Usually there's a motivation as to why you want to become a journalist. You know, I want to right some wrong in the world. So I, I think these are all things we've got to weigh up as we go about producing. Um, so yes, it, it should be about creating something that has value to a reader and, you know, if you've got no readers, you know, what's what's the point? It's just a vanity project and arguably lots of blogs are that and I certainly check myself on that. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it up so let's do final quick questions and uh, so Lua, let's start with you. Um, photos, audios, video, you can incorporate almost anything into a blog nowadays. Uh, how do you make the decision as to what's appropriate? I would imagine the tendency for some people is to try and do everything. Yeah, I, I guess as long as it um, doesn't double up on the story. I mean, you want to you wanna make sure that it's, you know, adding value to that story. It's telling, it's helping tell the story. Um, and yet, you know, like we never publish a blog without a photo or a video. It doesn't go up. Um, you know, it needs to have that content. Some people read, some people, you know, are more visual and some people like to read the words. So, uh, you know, it's about catering and making sure that your content is going to, it's so easy to just click onto another page. So making sure that you've got all the elements there to keep someone on your page. Um, and that's what photos and video, I think, I think do in a blog is keep them there. You know, if there's a lot of text that's really dense and, and you know, you can't be bothered to read it, it's just, you know, two seconds away to just go close or click or move on to the next blog. Uh, Kat, I'll ask the same question to you. How much is too much? When do you decide, um, or is it difficult deciding to not include things simply because you can do it in a blog? You know, yes. do, do you go for all the bells and whistles sure. or do you have to start thinking, no, 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 I don't need, you know, that, that's being gratuitous. Mm. What, what I want to do is just have a really, I want to this time just use mm. text or this time just use a photo. I don't have to have it all. I guess when I come back to my initial idea about um, it's about not questioning whether they're blogging or being or journalisming, it's the person behind it that we should be looking at. And I think the difference when we're talking about quality is that ability to moderate and understand your audience. And so you address the idea of too much or not enough by simply being good at your job <laughs> mm -hmm. and making that quality decision. And Erica, final question to you around moderation. Um, the posts that come in from the audience, from the public, uh, as we all know, as people who, who read unmoderated blog posts will know, some of them can be uh, rough and ready, some of them can be just outright libelous uh, and just plain rude and offensive. How do, do you moderate, do you mo moderate the, the comments on your blog? And if so, how do you moderate? The, what, what level of moderation are you looking for? Um, 
Well, that's that's the beauty of having a, mostly a readership that doesn't do a lot of commenting, I have to say. Um, but I will certainly not publish anything that is, uh, you know, defamatory towards someone else. Um, and I encourage commenters to um, think about what they're going to write before they do post something. Generally, I, I hit the, the publish button. There's, there's nothing ever, uh, you know, ever too terrible. However, I've noticed that, you know, um, the more you put out there, the more you're going to get back. So it's kind of like attracts like. Um, so if it's a highly controversial polemic you're putting out there, then you've, you just open the floodgates. So it, it, it's to be expected. And, and I think that that is the danger of being a solo blogger and why it's very good to have the backing of a masthead or a moderator in an environment because um, in, a, in a kind of office or a newsroom environment, it... Um, it's not an altogether nice experience. I know. Um, I know some people. Um, I said it was the final question. This is the, the final one. I know some people have. Um, some journalists have told me that when they actually brought in. This is a, a while ago now. But when they brought in moderation, they got responses from members of the public who said, "Thank you very much. I'm now happy to engage with you um, because I don't feel like I'm going to get abused." Uh, so there is that other other side to it sometimes necessary, isn't there? You know, you don't want to necessarily cut off free speech, no. but there is this kind of cutting off some people so that you can let other opinions come through. That's right. Um, it's kind of that that old bullying mentality, isn't it? Um, you know, you're in a you're in a playground and and the bullies there, and then perhaps the other kids don't get to you know have their fun and and do what they want to do or have their say. Um, and it's not it kind of just spoils it for everyone, doesn't it? So I think that I think it's it's just quite sensible to have some at least basic level of decorum in terms of online conduct. Um, but again. Um, then, you know, freedom of speech is a whole other topic that we could... And we to. can't cover that today because we've sadly got to wrap up at this point. So thank you very much to everybody who's joined us via the live webcam, everybody who's come here as well today to be in the, uh, in the live audience uh, for this particular panel session. Thank you also to our panellists, to Kat Feeney, to Erica Bartle and to Salua Middleton. Um, I'm Anthony Fennell and thank you very much for the people who put the, uh, the questions together. Before I, um, I hand over a couple of quick things, if you are interested in participating in the Citizen J project that's going on here at the Edge, you can register your interest by giving your email to the Edge staff members, and there'll be Edge staff members around here. So if you do want to register at this stage, please come to the front here uh, once we finally finish. Uh, if not, just get in touch with the Edge about finding out a bit more about Citizen J and also about joining if you do know what it's about. And uh, the final thing is, let me invite you all to join us for a drink, refreshments. Uh, wouldn't be a journalistic function without booze. Uh, so, so that will be outside uh, after that. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. And let's give our panellists a round of applause.